Well, thank you very much for that introduction, for the opportunity to be with you this morning. It is a joy to, to be here at Countryside. I've had the joy a couple of times over the past several years to be here on, on a Friday night for a men's event. Uh, I think uh, this past August and then two years prior uh, was here to uh, spend some time with the men, and that was a joy, but to be here on a Sunday morning and to be with with uh, this local congregation is a special privilege for me, and I, I thank you for this opportunity and, and for your hospitality. It's, it's been so great to be here this weekend uh, to see how your church has so wonderfully ministered to guests like me and to all the other guests who are here. It's uh, so, so very heartwarming to see the body of Christ in action and especially around such a, an important topic as, as eschatology and our understanding and our study of the last things. Well, this session I have the, the joy of opening up a, a very important portion of Scripture dealing with the rapture. Now, when we talk about the rapture, and even when we mention the word rapture, Automatically, there's, there's some mixed feelings because of a lot of baggage that has been attached to it, both because of uh, some, some of the, the speculative uh, thinkers out there who have, who have attached to the, the doctrine of the rapture some, some pretty outlandish things, and, and as well from the culture. There is a lot of derision that is directed toward those who would affirm the rapture and believe the rapture and and teach on the rapture. Now, to give you an idea of the kind of, of derision that is out there, I want to read to you from an article uh, that was uh, posted uh, online in, in CNN. And yes, yeah, CNN, the most trusted name in biblical interpretation. Uh, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of the common perception in the culture, uh, even, even among those who would broadly label themselves Christian or part of a Christian culture. This article is entitled, Even Jesus Wouldn't Buy the Rapture, uh, written by Jay Perini. And he writes, as part of his article, these words. He says, quote, The rapture notion goes like this. Jesus is coming back, and when he does, he will first return before a time of so-called tribulation begins, calling up into the clouds with him those who are saved. Horrible suffering will then occur on the miserable earth for seven years. Then Jesus will come again for a final judging. There are many different versions of this scenario, so it's difficult to summarize. It's fair to say, however, that only fundamentalist Protestant churches bother to think about the rapture at all. The rapture concept, he goes on to say, is relatively new. It started with an Anglo-Irish theologian who in the 1830s invented the concept. This may come as a shocker to many, but it's a fact. Before John Nelson Darby imagined the scenario in the clouds, no Christian had ever heard of the rapture. It's a problem, however, for rapture-minded Christians that the word rapture doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible unless you're willing to think in broadly metaphorical terms. It's clear from looking carefully at everything Paul says about the future, as in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, or Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21, that, that he, that is Paul, believes only that someday Christians will experience a kind of physical and spiritual change. They will be resurrected, but this is a complex term that suggests not necessarily resuscitation, but evolution, a, a thorough transformation. And then he closes his article and, and says this, Yet it's amazing how scriptures get misused and relatively new theological ideas such as the rapture get deeply embedded in certain circles. The rapture is really a plot device for popular entertainment and a bizarre theological teaching in fundamentalist circles where it functions in a variety of ways, but it's bad theology and Jesus himself would have been astonished to learn that thousands of years after him, there were such notions afloat, end quote. Now that is the perspective of someone truly outside the church, but even more closely, those who would more 
more directly identify themselves as Protestants, as Christians, in the broader realm of Christendom, would also similarly ridicule the idea of the rapture. N.T. Wright, for example, a British theologian, wrote this, and he should know better, but this is what he says. He says, Paul's description of Jesus' reappearance in 1 Thessalonians 4 is a brightly colored version of what he says in two other passages, 1 Corinthians 15, 51-54, and Philippians 3, 20-21. At Jesus' coming or appearing, those who are still alive will be changed or transformed so that their mortal bodies will become incorruptible, deathless. This is all that Paul intends to say in Thessalonians. Little did he know how his rich metaphors would be understood two millennia later, end quote. And N.T. Wright goes on himself to deride the doctrine of the rapture. Well, is the doctrine of the rapture taught in the Bible? Now, the answer to that is yes, and that is what our focus will be this morning. And contrary to the caricatures of men like N.T. Wright and, and columnists for CNN, The Bible is explicit, it is clear, on the doctrine of the rapture, and as we're going to see, the the doctrine of the rapture, and even the term the rapture, is very much a biblical term, though we will see it in its original language uh, as we get into our text this morning. Now, before we get into 1 Thessalonians 4, you can turn there already. I want to give a little overview of 1 Thessalonians because it's important to understand where our text fits into the argument and flow of this letter that Paul writes. The first letter, the canonical letter that Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians, he writes it around the, the year of AD 50, just six months at most after he had uh, planted the church in Thessalonica. He was on his second missionary journey. He had brought the gospel to the city of Thessalonica and then had to leave because of persecution, goes to Berea, and had to leave Berea because of persecution, ends up heading to Athens, spends a little bit of time there, gives his famous Mars Hill address, and then ends up in Corinth. And as he's in Corinth, he receives a report from Timothy about the state of the church in Thessalonica, and that is what prompts Paul, just a few months after being in Thessalonica, to write this letter to the Thessalonians. And when we look at the letter, we see it is essentially comprised of of six major units. He begins in chapter 1 with a thanksgiving as he gives thanks to God for the dramatic, for the authentic, for the impactful salvation that he had brought to the Thessalonians. He then in chapter 2 develops a defense for the ministry in Thessalonica, and it wasn't because the Thessalonians themselves were were suspicious of Paul's past ministry. Rather, those Thessalonians were facing opposition and ostracism from the culture, and it appears from our reading of the letter that certain opponents of the church were seeking to destroy it by attacking the Apostle Paul, and so he gives this defense, this very important defense in chapter 2. That transitioned then into another thanksgiving section and and a little bit more spent in in an explanation of of why Paul could not return to the Thessalonians as much as he had wanted to. He had been prevented from returning due to some very dramatic reasons. And then at at, at the end of that section, in in verse 10 of chapter 3, he makes reference to his desire to return to meet what was lacking in the faith of the Thessalonians. He, he says this in verses 9 and 10 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and complete what is lacking in your faith. 
the untimely forced departure of the Apostle Paul from Thessalonica meant that there was some unfinished business. There was some untaught material, some untaught doctrine. He had wanted to stay longer. He had been forced out, and his heart was burdened for the Thessalonians and the situations, the circumstances they were facing, and and he wanted to minister to them in that area of what was lacking. And and then in the very next verses, verses 11, 12, and 13, we can we can see those verses, that prayer as a as Paul's prayerful response to what was lacking in the faith of the Thessalonians. But then we get to the section in the letter where the rubber meets the road. From chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 22. The Apostle Paul deals with what was lacking in the Thessalonians' faith. And he deals with multiple issues in that section. But the text that we have before us this morning, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, deal with one of those issues in which the faith of the Thessalonians was lacking. There was something that was missing in their understanding. And Timothy had brought a report back to Paul and said, Paul, here is the lack. Paul first prays for it and then he deals with it. And and we can read, as we will see in just a moment, from verses 13 to 18 to see, specifically in verses 13 and 14, that the Thessalonians were particularly concerned about their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who had passed away in the preceding months. We don't know exactly what happened, whether it was due to natural causes such as illness or whether it was due to persecution. We really don't know, but what we do find out, and as we're going to see, is that there was a concern for those who had fallen asleep in Christ. Some within the church, after coming to know Christ, believing in the gospel, had died. And the Thessalonians who were very much awaiting the return of Christ, were concerned about those who had died. Would they in some way miss out on the eschatological blessings that Christ would bring to his people? One commentator summarizes the the concern in these words. He says, the most likely explanation is that the Thessalonians' confusion over how precisely the one eschatological event involving the resurrection of deceased believers coordinated with other future events involving Christ's return led to the fear that their fellow church members who had already died would be at some kind of disadvantage at the parousia, the coming of Christ, compared to themselves who are still alive. Now we can somewhat understand them. We have this sense in which the dead, we think, are disadvantaged. That if there's any position to be in at the coming of Christ when he comes for his church, it would be the living. We, we have this idea that it is better to be alive in this earth than to be dead, even in Christ. That is a That is a common feeling that we have, and you can even just sense your own perception or your own relationship to death, and there is that gut feeling that death somehow disadvantages. And that's what we see with the Thessalonians. They were concerned that if someone died before Christ would come to gather his church and rescue them from the wrath to come, that somehow those dead believers would be disadvantaged. Maybe they wouldn't participate at all in that parousia, that coming of Christ. Maybe they wouldn't receive their bodies. Maybe they would be missing something in, in the eschatological blessings to come. They were concerned, and it was a lack in their faith. And so the Apostle Paul, beginning in chapter 4, verse 13, begins to minister to this lack. Let's look first of all at verses 13 and 14. He writes this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, 
so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now just a few comments on these verses because we don't find the rapture here yet. But here Paul emphasizes the fact that doctrine makes all the difference. That in response to the lack in the Thessalonian faith, what they needed was instruction. They didn't just need someone to put an arm around them and say, It'll just, it's going to be okay. No, what Paul says is that we don't want you to be uninformed. You, you need teaching. You need truth. He refers to those who had fallen asleep. That's not a reference to soul sleep. It is a reference to physical death. Those who had had died in Christ. And then he goes on in verse 15 to say this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now he's beginning to get close to the instruction that would be most comforting to the Thessalonians. And he begins with this emphasis on divine authority. And this speaks to the general malaise or even the ridicule that is out there today with respect to eschatological issues. Paul wants the Thessalonians to know this is serious. And he begins his statement with these words, this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is authoritative, and this instruction comes from the very mouth of the Lord himself. It is as if, if you had a red-letter Bible, you could begin the red-letter font right after this. Some would say, well, what Jesus teaches is always most uh, the, the priority, most authoritative. Now, that is not a proper way to understand divine revelation, but even if you had that thought that, well, Jesus has to speak the most important words, Paul is saying these are the words of Jesus. This comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. And then he goes on in this statement here in verse 15 to to emphasize a very important reality. The dead are not disadvantaged. That with reference to future eschatological events... The dead are the first ones to receive the blessing. We will not precede those, he says. We will not precede those who have fallen asleep, referring to the resurrection. And we're going to get into that in in verses 16 and 17. But there is an important phrase here I want you to notice. Paul refers to the coming of the Lord. This is the, the, the translation of the Greek word parousia. Parousia. And parousia, that Greek word, has one of two possible notions. One is the idea that the the entrance or the act of coming, and another nuance has more to do with the state of being with. But we know the parousia is the coming of Christ. And in the letter to the Thessalonians, Paul has already referred to this coming several times. You can go back to chapter 2, verse 19, where he says this, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his parousia, at his coming? And then we see, we see this same word, in that prayer for the Thessalonians, in the prayer for their lack. In chapter 3, the prayer reads as follows, beginning in verse 11, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the parousia, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The coming of the Lord. Now what does that look like? Now the coming of the Lord in the book of Thessalonians, as if we would look at the whole book, has, 
has really two sides to the coin. We are going to look at the side that relates to the church in chapter 4. There's another aspect to this coming of the Lord, and that is what is known as the day of the Lord, and that relates to unbelievers. And that is what Paul addresses in chapter 5. We won't get there this morning, but we want to look at how the coming of the Lord relates to believers, and, and Paul instructs the Thessalonians in this because they needed this comfort as they thought about death and they thought about the future and recon- tried to reconcile those two things, this instruction, particularly on the rapture, on the coming of the Lord, is to bring comfort. And this is what Paul says. And this is really the crux of the teaching. Verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, And with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Now, when we look at these verses, there is an interesting note to make about the grammar. It doesn't come through necessarily in the English so much as in the original. But one of the important features of this text is that Paul is giving a sequence of events, or what you could say, a sequence of stages in an event. Contrary to what is often claimed, that Paul's teaching on This coming of the Lord in chapter 4 is just metaphorical. It lacks specificity. It's not intended to be taken in detail. Paul makes it clear as he writes that we are to understand that this coming of the Lord has specific detail, specific stages that come in a particular order. We are not to gloss over these These stages, these details quickly, they are intended for our very comfort. And as we look at this text and what we'll look at for the rest of this this hour is is the four stages that are involved with the parousia or the coming of the Lord Jesus with respect to the church, with respect to those in Christ. Four stages in this Parousia. Number one, we will see the details surrounding the descent of the person of Christ. The first half of verse 16. Stage two, we will look at the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Verse 16b. The third stage is the rapture of all believers to Christ the first half of verse 17, and then stage four, the future of the church with Christ. And we will see that at the end of verse 17. Let's look at the first stage, stage one, the descent of the person of Christ. Paul writes these these words in the first half of verse 16. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. He begins with this this explanatory conjunction for, which immediately causes us to look back to the preceding verse to to see that Paul is, is continuing an explanation of something that he has just said. And at the end of verse 15, we read this, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. There at the end of verse 15, Paul has made a denial. He's made a denial that, that, that we who are alive get the advantage. He's made a denial that that's not the case. He said we who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So now in verse 16, as he continues, that four there at the beginning of verse 16 serves to introduce the affirmation. After denying what will not happen, he now introduces and asserts what will happen. 
And he goes on to say this, for the Lord himself will descend. And, and that phrase there, the Lord himself, is emphatic. It is intended to attract the attention in a heightened way from the listener. When, when the, the letter would have been read there in the Thessalonian congregation, they would have recognized uh, the, the presence of a pronoun here in the text that brings emphasis and attention, that it is the Lord who himself will descend. Not some other, not some deputy, not some ambassador, not some delegate, not some surrogate. It will be the Lord, the Lord Jesus himself, and, and he will descend. Now what is important to note about this verb is, is that Paul doesn't say he will return. It says he will descend, and the choice of that verb is important. Here, Paul is emphasizing not a return to, to live on the face of the earth at this point, but a descent, a move downward, a move downward into a different region. Now, before Paul explains what that region is, you'll get to that in a, in a, in a few words as we continue through this study. But we first have to note from where he descends, and Paul says he descends from heaven. Now that is a very important uh, little phrase there, a little prepositional phrase. When we see this all together, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven, Paul is echoing something that he has just mentioned earlier in the letter. Turn back to chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. In chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the apostle Paul culminates his great thanksgiving section as he glorified God for the salvation that he brought to the Thessalonians. And as he culminates that thanksgiving section, he describes the kind of testimony that these Thessalonian converts, within just months of their conversion, how that testimony was reverberating in the, the Greek provinces of Macedonia and Achaia, and at the end of this Thanksgiving section, Paul describes what people are now saying about the Thessalonians. And, and Paul writes this, For they themselves, others, report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And, verse 10, this is critical, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, from the wrath to come. Now that same terminology is now used here in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And it ties us back to that very same thought that the Thessalonians were already awaiting Jesus from heaven. They were awaiting rescue from what they knew was coming. They knew the day of the Lord was coming. They knew wrath was on its way, and they were looking to heaven for rescue. They, they knew that they would be rescued from this, and, and, and now Paul ties into that teaching and says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And not only that, but we have some details about the manner of this descent from heaven. It's extraordinary. It comes, first of all, with a shout. With a shout. And, and this isn't just a normal shout. The, the word that is used here is a rare word. In fact, it's only found one time in the New Testament, but it's found outside the New Testament and other writings of, of the Greek language. And it was used to refer to a sudden command that was given by a military commander, a military general. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with this sudden, loud, and attention-getting shout. The kind that a, a military commander would deliver to get the attention of his troops and to order them in some particular manner. Paul further describes what this shout looks like. He says it comes with the voice of the archangel. Now the only thing in the New Testament that we know about the archangel is actually found in Jude 9 referring to 
to Michael as an archangel. Jude 9 says, but Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, he he did not dare to pronounce against him a, a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So in Jude 9, Jude refers to an archangel named uh, uh, named Michael. And, and so it's very, very much likely that this is the, the angel that's in, intended here. Michael, the archangel. Though Paul doesn't say, but he does refer to this archangel, this leader of the angelic host. The Jews themselves, by the way, were, were quite fascinated with the study of angels. And if you look in the apocryphal writings, they listed the names that uh, they had come up with with uh, respect to archangels, and they listed seven of these super angels. But we only know of one. His name's Michael in Jude 9, and he's referred to here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet was a very important metaphor, a picture, and it was used in those days to refer either to the summon of a, of a military general of his army to gather, again, for some kind of movement, or it was even used to refer to the gathering of a people for worship. And likely here, the connection is back to Isaiah 27, verse 13, where we read these words. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown and those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So there in the book of Isaiah, the concept of this trumpet of God has the idea of gathering together God's people for presentation. For presentation, for worship. So this is stage one, the descent of the person of Christ and the details associated with it. And it's important to note this as we think and reflect upon the comfort that this would bring to the Thessalonians. Jesus himself will descend. Jesus himself, the one whom we have not seen and whom we do not now see, yet love. This one is coming for us. He's not sending a delegate. He's not charging this responsibility to some other ambassador, some other apostle. He himself will descend. And this descent will not be some small, quiet descent, unnoticeable, we may miss it kind of thing. No, Paul is emphasizing here to the Thessalonians who needed comfort, listen, yes, you are being ostracized by the world. Some of your number have perished. This world is cursed. Judgment is coming. The day of the Lord is on its way, but beloved, the one whom you love, he himself is coming. That's the first stage, the descent of the person of Christ. Let's now look at the second stage, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. This is found at the end of verse 16 where the Apostle Paul adds to his instruction of affirmations, and he says this, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, what's interesting here is that Paul refers to the dead. In the preceding verses, in verses 13, 14, and 15, as Paul sought to bring comfort to the Thessalonians over the deceased, he referred to them in those verses as those who have fallen asleep. As a pastor comforting his precious congregation, Paul was 
was using the right words and, and emphasizing future hope, even in those designations, they have just fallen asleep. Their bodies are just lying down for now, but, but they will rise as anyone who does when, he, when he's asleep. But here Paul changes the terminology to bring in now the stark nature of reality, the dead. The dead, no more euphemistic language for Paul. He refers to the dead because he, he, he is getting their attention and, and bringing us to the grips of this supernatural event that is going to take place. He, he, and he says this, the dead in Christ. Notice he limits this reference here. He doesn't just say all the dead or just leave it at the dead will rise first. He adds this little prepositional phrase in Christ which is a very important designation in this text. This instruction on the resurrection is limited to a, a, a very select category. As one commentator states, the phrase limits the scope of the dead to those who experienced physical death while in spiritual union with Christ. These are the dead in Christ that will be resurrected first at the coming of the Lord. And therefore, it is important to take from this the, the right conclusion that Paul is referring here in this instruction to church age believers. To church age believers. And sometimes believers, as they read the whole of the New Testament, particularly Revelation chapter 20, and I'll address that in the next seminar, but in Revelation chapter 20, it refers to, to, uh, uh, to, to two resurrections there. And, and, and believers will seek to harmonize 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, with Revelation chapter 20. But these are referring to different resurrections. The resurrection of the church is a wholly unique resurrection of which Christ was the first fruits, and we are considered to be part of his resurrection because we have been united with him and grafted into him. And so the resurrections of Revelation 20 are for a different category of people. So who are those in Christ? Those in Christ are those who have been united with Christ through the gospel message from the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 to the time when this moment happens. This, is, this includes a very select group of people. It does not include Old Testament saints. Because the term in Christ, when you read the New Testament, especially Paul's writings, it is a reference only to believers in the church age who through the baptism of the Spirit have been engrafted and spiritually united with Jesus Christ, having him as the head of the church, we have been grafted into his body. And so this resurrection here is not a resurrection of the unrighteous. It's not even a, a resurrection of the Old Testament saints. It is a resurrection that is preserved and, 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 and directed at those who have come to faith in Jesus during the church age. You look at this phrase, in Christ, even within the context of this letter. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul writes to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. You could look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, which describe the church age and what is unique about the church age. Paul says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So the audience that we are talking about in this text are those who are truly in Christ, spiritually united in him. And Paul says they will rise first. They will rise. They will come back to life from the dead. 
those who died as believers will in supernatural in a supernatural moment that reflects what happened to Jesus' own body, they will participate in that resurrection and they will rise from the dead. And as Paul has already emphasized, those who have died and preceded us, they get their bodies first. They have the advantage. And so Paul is emphasizing to these Thessalonians Dear Thessalonians, the the dead in Christ, they're not disadvantaged. They're not missing out on any of the future eschatological blessings. In fact, even though the, the, the difference will be infinitesimal, nonetheless, God gives them pride of place. They are the first ones in this event to receive their bodies, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And when we think of that for just a moment, I want you to pause and I want you to think of the implication of that little phrase, in Christ, as you yourself are drawing comfort and reassurance and hope from this text, the the, the immediate question that must be asked is, are you in Christ? Because if you are outside of that designation, that tiny preposition in, if you are outside, then understand this. This does no longer apply to you. You're outside of this instruction. And, and this, is, this is what you're looking for. This is, this is what your, your heart is, is, is aiming for. You want to be in Christ. This is, this is Paul's instruction. This is the comfort for the church. It is for those who have been spiritually unified to Christ. Let's look now at the, the third stage. After you have the descent of the person of Christ, second, you, you then have the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And now you have stage three, the rapture of all believers to Christ. Verse 17a, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now this is the statement that receives all the ridicule from the world and is so often glossed over even by many commentators. It's an uncomfortable verse for those who think the rapture is just a a weird, quacky idea spun up in 1830 by John Nelson Darby. They come to this verse and they get uncomfortable and find all kinds of way to dismiss this by saying Paul is just speaking apocalyptically. He's just speaking poetically. This is just a picture. You're not to take this language seriously. But first of all, as we look at this text more closely, we see that Paul includes another grammatical indication here that he's talking about details of an actual event. He then says then. That is a specific word, a grammatical indication, a term that Paul uses to, to designate sequence. It's not, not all just some kind of big picture where everything just runs together. He says, then. And then he refers to those who are alive and remain. We who are alive and remain. It's repeated from verse 15 when Paul gives the denial that we who are alive and remain will not precede those who have fallen asleep in Christ. And notice something very important here. The pronoun that is used, again, emphatic. We who are alive. You might look at that and say, okay, yeah, uh, two different categories. But the pronoun here is indicative of a very important reality. The Apostle Paul, as he writes this, identifies with this category. And as we look at this, even in the context of chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, and even into chapter 5, it, is, it becomes very apparent that Paul believed or was of the conviction that he would be alive when this would happen. He does not look at this as some event that is never going to happen for hundreds of years. He teaches what we call the doctrine of imminency. The doctrine of imminency. And that doctrine of imminency teaches that 
on the one hand, no one knows the time or the hour, not even Paul. Secondly, it could happen at any moment. And third, we are to approach that event as imminent. That we are to relate to it, even though we don't know the time or the hour, it could happen at any moment, and we are to treat this as if it could happen even in our lives, and not just in our lives, but it could happen tomorrow, or it could happen today, it could happen this very hour. And this we get from the apostle Paul. He sees that, that, that this event is, is so imminent, is, is on its way, so much so that Paul thinks it's going to happen in his own lifetime to him. He identifies himself with we who are alive. And that is something that is testimonial of Paul's faith. You look at it in, in his letters, and there is this consistent belief that, that the Lord is near. And when he uses that phrase, the Lord is near, such as in Philippians 4, he, he's, not, he's not talking about the comfort of the Lord. He's talking about this event. It is near. And he says this, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now this is the, this is the key verb. We will be caught up. We who are alive and remain will be caught up. That verb expressed here in the future is the Greek verb harpadzain. Harpadzain. And, and what does that verb mean? That verb is, is used here, is, is actually found 14 times in the New Testament. And it has several nuances. The two most common nuances are these. Number one, it means to make off with someone's property by attacking or seizing it. So it has the idea of, of plundering, to seize and to steal away. A second major nuance is, is this, to, to grab or seize suddenly so as to remove or gain control. And so is, is uh, translated with the idea of to snatch away and even to kidnap. And as I said, this is not an uncommon verb in the New Testament, the one that's used here. We find it, for example, in Matthew 13, verse 19, in the parable of the sower and the soils. And Jesus says this, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes away and raptures it, snatches it away, snatches away what has been sown in his heart. We see it in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. When they, that is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord raptured Philip away, kidnapped him, so to speak, seized him, and the eunuch no longer saw him. Paul uses this term in 2 Corinthians 12 when he speaks of his encounter of the third heaven. And he uses it twice. He says this, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was raptured. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was raptured, was caught up into paradise and heard unexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. So this verb here, first of all, understand this, is not a verb that is misunderstood or unidentifiable. The scholars who give the impression that the rapture is nowhere found in the Bible and that you don't come across it until 1830 are misrepresenting the truth. Now, the verb doesn't appear here in the Greek as to rapture. That would be, ridic that would be ridiculous. It actually comes from a Latin translation of the Greek. So the Greek verb is harpadzain, to snatch away. The Latin translates this as rapere. And from rapere, we get rapture. There is an etymological connection there between our English rapture and rapere. So you go from the Greek, harpadzain, to the Latin rapere, to the English rapture. Now those who say that the rapture is never found in the Bible, like I said, are intentionally misleading people. And an easy equation would be to say the word justification is never in the Bible. And you might say, how could you say that? Well, look for it in the Greek. You'll never find the word 
Justification in the Greek. Our, word, our English word justification actually comes from the Latin, not the Greek. But we don't have a problem with saying that justification is found in the Bible. The ra- word rapture is found in the Bible. Harpazane. Now what does it mean? What is he talking about here? Jesus, uh, Paul writes this about the Lord Jesus. We will be caught up together. Jesus being the intended agent of this passive verb. We will be caught up together with them. We will be seized. And the idea of that verb there is that the object of what is being seized is not instigating, is not participating in it. It it is caught by surprise. And we are the ones who are caught by surprise. In other words, we don't bring this into occurrence. It happens to us. And Paul says it happens this way, we will be raptured together with them, the dead in Christ who just received their resurrected bodies. Now this is an amazing thought. Think of it this way, that if we here in this room are still alive at that moment, when that happens, immediately preceding this being caught up together in the air by the Lord, there will be the resurrection of all the church age believers from all time. And then our seizing up to be with the Lord will take place and we will be united with them in the clouds as we are going to see. Now, what is amazing to think of that is that here is the first time in the history of the church where the entire church will meet together. All the saints of the church age, everyone in Christ, all those great heroes of the faith, Luther, Calvin, all those unnamed believers of whom we know nothing, everyone together from the day of Pentecost to whatever moment this event occurs, we'll meet together in one great congregation. And it'll be in the clouds, out of the view from those on earth. This place of great reunion, Paul summarizes this in in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 52. He he describes this same event with these words, and it helps us understand the, the rapture of this moment. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Notice how he again uses the pronoun, we will not all sleep. But we will all be changed. We will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. First the dead in Christ receive their resurrected bodies, and then we will receive our glorified bodies. Yes, we who are alive will not experience death Instead, instantaneously, in that moment, if we are alive at the moment of this rapture, our bodies will be changed instantly. And we will receive that perfect, glorified version of whoever we are. And notice the ultimate purpose of this moment, the rapture. The purpose is expressed in that statement. It is to meet the Lord, or literally, for the meeting of the Lord. For the meeting of the Lord. Now this is a a very interesting statement. And when, when, when we dig down deep into it, there have been some suggestions that this expression, for the meeting of the Lord, for the meeting of the Lord, some have sought to liken that to the residents of a city who will go out and meet a dignitary and then accompany him back into the city. That was a, an idea that gained some traction in, 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 due to some work of some scholars uh, 
several decades ago as they, they said, hey, look, let's look at this term for the meeting uh, of the Lord, for the meeting, and, and look at that specific term, meeting, and see if we can find it in other literature and how it is, is described, and it is used elsewhere. And sometimes it does seem to suggest that the nature of this meeting is this, this departure of the city and then a return into the city with the dignitary. Now, if that is the case, then it would have this idea of an out and a back kind of feeling to it. So, in other words, the dead in Christ would rise first, we who are alive would, would receive our glorified bodies, and we would together meet in the air, in the clouds, and then return with Jesus to the earth. That's this proposal. But it doesn't fit the best context here, and that proposal stretches the use of that term in other contexts. There's a much better way to understand what Paul is describing here in verse 17. It is not a meeting to, to go and meet the Lord in the air and then return back into the city. Instead, Paul is drawing upon, he's drawing upon the, the notion of a, of a bridegroom coming to get his bride. And how do we know that? Well, first of all, let me read from one writer on this. Kevin Zuber writes this, A better metaphor is that of the bride and the bridegroom. In this, you, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and following, pictures a bridegroom coming to retrieve his bride in fulfillment of his promise. This is a bride who has been made ready for her reception at the groom's home. Once the groom meets the bride, he takes the bride to his father's house where the wedding feast will complete the formal union of the marriage. There in Jew Jewish culture, that was the, the, that was the picture. The bridegroom would, would build his home there on the, the, his father's land and, and he would prepare for the wedding by preparing that, that house and then at the, on the day of the wedding, the bridegroom, when he was all ready, would go and, and he would go for his bride and she would come out of her father's home and they would meet. And then at that moment, the bridegroom would take the bride back. That was the picture. That was the analogy. And you might say, well, how does that fit here? Well, first of all, before we go back to 1 Thessalonians, go to John chapter 14 for just a moment, and here we find that same analogy. John 14, verses 2 and 3 says this, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now those words are very similar to what we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. But there's another text in Thessalonians that helps us see that this is the picture of what's taking place. When we talk about the rapture, it is not that we, we are caught up in the clouds for a moment and then return to the earth. It is, it is a different picture. We are caught up in the clouds to be taken by Christ, and we are taken not back to earth. The raptured church is taken to the presence of the Father, and we see this in a very important text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just go a few verses prior to what we are just studying here, to back to that prayer as Paul prays for that which was lacking in the faith of the Thessalonians. And notice his prayer. Notice what he is ultimately praying for. He says, May our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we also do for you so that he that is Jesus may establish your hearts without blame in holiness where before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints that verse tells us what will happen in verse 17. That prayer 
is for the Thessalonians that God would, and this is praying according to God's will, that God and, and, and Jesus would, would use the means of Paul's instruction so that the Thessalonians would increase and abound in their growth, their spiritual growth, their love for one another, and, and that there's an ultimate purpose so that Jesus, the bridegroom, would establish their hearts white, pure, in holiness, blameless, and that takes place before the Father. And that event occurs when Jesus has come for his church, his bride, he gathers the bride to himself, and then he goes to the Father, and before the Father, says, here she is, pure and without blame. And what Paul prays for here is what he describes in verse 17, that this will happen when we, the dead in Christ, those who are dead in Christ, are resurrected in glory, we who are alive and remain are changed, we are purified, glorified, we're caught up together with all the saints and the Lord Jesus takes us to present before the Father. Finally, there's one final stage and it is a final culmination to this description. Paul says, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Here is the life of the church with Christ. That final stage, end of verse 17, Paul concludes this sequence with this final statement, and so. And, and then he describes what will then be a permanent existence. We shall always be. Not most of the time, not some of the time, but always we will be. And this is the ultimate comfort that we gather from these words because we will always be with the Lord. Here is the realization of all our hope. You want to know what Christian hope looks like? You define it in these terms, to be with the Lord always. That is our hope. It's not for the streets of gold, although that will be. It's not for a world without sin. That will be. It is not for all the exciting new things we get to do with our perfected state. That will be. But the ultimate expression of Christian hope is to be always with the Lord. And Paul says, for the church, at this moment, it'll be. It will be. As one writer states, the entire content and worth of heaven, the entire blessedness of life eternal is for Paul embraced in the one thought of being united with Christ, his Savior and Lord. And then we see in that moment that great transition because right now we are described as those who are in Christ. We are spiritually united with him. But as great as that is, that mysterious union is not the ultimate. The ultimate is physical presence. The ultimate is no longer just to be in Christ. It is to be with him, to see his face, and to be like him as he is. And that is the ultimate accomplishment of the rapture of the church. And that stanza of how great that art, we, we see how that looks when the writer Stuart Hine writes these words, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Now there's one more verse that is part of this section. After Paul describes the stages, he ends with these words. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort. These words, which are often derided 
by Christians and non-Christians alike are actually intended to be our greatest measure of hope and comfort and surety in this world. Do not let the naysayers and the scoffers steer you away from the import and application of these verses. They are precious. Don't let anyone take them from you. And they're needed now as much as ever. Use these words, beloved, regularly in your comfort of one another. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. Without it, we would be in a dark place without hope. And yet you've given us your word to give us light to our path. And that light doesn't just describe what you have already done in redemptive history in sending your own son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and to take care of our sin problem. But you have given us your word so that we might understand what is to come, so that we would not fear, so that we would have hope and comfort, and so that we would be certain. I pray you'd use these words in the lives of those who are here this morning, my life, to give me this surety and comfort which you so intend. And may that surety and comfort exude from us in this dark world as a magnetism to draw those who are fearful to Jesus Christ and to the hope of eternal life and glory that he offers. We ask this in his precious name. Amen.